welcome back to SEO on Air. We took a break for a little while, but we're back and we're super excited to have Chris Dreyer, CEO and founder of Rankings.io, um, also the host of the Personal Injury Mastermind, a podcast that I think just hit the 140th episode today or yesterday itself. Yeah. yeah. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, in our initial conversation that we had, I think around two weeks ago, um, we were just talking, talking about topics that we would have. And the first thing I think was the Google helpful content. And mm-hmm. uh, with that, I think already finished rolling out and the September core update happening also. Um, it's just hit after hit for you itself because I think Penguin core update was your initial start to mm-hmm. law firm SEO. Yeah, back in the day, around, let's say, 2010 to 2012, when I was doing affiliate marketing, I was looking short-term. I was playing the short-term game. I was taking looking at those quick wins. I was outsourcing a ton of content. I wasn't looking at value. I was It was purely a quantitative perspective, not qualitative. Yeah. So back then, when I had all those affiliate sites that were doing really well, when that first Penguin algorithm hit, I got nuked. I went yeah. from doing really well to nothing, and I knew the climb was going to be steep. Hmm. Now, fast forward to the agency. First of all, I have different uh, levels of risk. I have, I'm okay with a lot of risk myself for my personal things, but for my clients, I would never put them at risk. So we take a long-term perspective, an evergreen perspective. So typically, when there's an algorithm update, we actually benefit, typically. Right. So this Google, so this most recent algorithm update, we track AREF's traffic value for all of our clients on a weekly basis as a leading indicator. So we get to see if there's any volatility. And we actually benefited the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the lighter algorithm updates in the legal industry because they were already heavily heavily scrutinized through EAT, through expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness, just like the medical and uh, industry. And I truthfully, I believe there's a lot more to this than what Google's outwardly saying. Right. We noticed that early 2022, crawl rates were abysmal. Pages weren't indexing. It was taking forever to get them crawled. Everyone can go check their Google Search Console to notice this. And just the amount of resources that Google requires to crawl the web is, is tremendous. And it continues to grow. And this is one of the first times that I can recall, I've been doing SEO for a long time, that they've been very proactive and very public about purging old content. And it makes sense because then it lowers their cost to crawl the web. It lowers the amount of resources they need to crawl the web. And I think that's the same reason why they kind of hid in there some of those subliminal things about AI and and that type of content. It's They don't want to continue to expand the web, just expand it because it really affects their resources. Yeah, I think in that way, Google tries to, uh, you put it properly, it's a fear monger people into this. 1000%. There's what John Mueller says, and there's what, what Google really means behind it. <laughs> it's a the little double meaning in that line we have to cross to actually figure out what they really mean and what we should do about it instead. Let's say I'm a regular person who is just getting into the field of digital marketing. And now while I'm not just digital marketing, SEO and all things related, if I do want to boost my business or have any business itself, how does any of these updates really affect me? Am I getting really penalized by something or is Google hinting that I should just change a few things to get promoted instead? Specifically, if you've got a site that's been around for a long period of time that has a lot of thin content that doesn't provide value to the consumers, this people first content that they're looking for, one of the thir- first things you want to do is look and see, should I purge this content or should I refresh it? Should I, should I be creating new content or should I be improving my existing library? Now, there are tactics in how to determine which pages to purge. You can use Google Analytics as the most rudimentary basic step. Just go check your landing pages and do some period reviews. You can also export your whole site using a, a tool like Screaming Frog and then dump it into SimRush or ARES to check, you know, through a batch analysis point of view right. if you have a much larger site. So that can help narrow it in. And I would say that if it's an old 
news-based article, it may not be wise to refresh it, but you may want to delete it and then permanent 301 redirect it to retain that link equity. Okay. If it was an article made for social proof that functions to help the sales as sales support, you may not need to refresh it, but you may want to keep it. It may be an important navigational page you want to keep. And then there are some pages that it's just not worth your time. They don't have any links. They don't have any traffic. For me, and this is kind of, this is where the SEO specialist listening and be like, oh my gosh, they're going to freak out. I don't, if this page doesn't get traffic and it doesn't have any links, it's not a core navigational page. I just delete it. I don't even do a 301 direct. I, I don't want to add that extra. Calm down, SEO specialist. He, he, yeah. He's, he does, yeah. He's not throwing any fire on anyone. <laughs> it's just personal right. opinion. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so I think that's how also um, Rankings IO pretty much handles their, um, their taking of how an update comes forward and how they pretty much uh, work around it. Like I said, I think we've benefited. I if If, if we're... Using video here, I I like to use this analogy. So imagine that all of the link equity externally pointing to your website was in a pitcher of water. And you had a thousand pages and you went and poured that pitcher of water on those thousand pages. Well, each page may have just a little bit of water. And you had, let's say, 300 dead pages or 500. And you went and deleted those and you did the 301s to the proper pages. And he took that same pitcher of water and you poured it on your site. Each page would get a little bit more. So it's actually a perfect analogy. We've been doing this for a long time, anyways. We want we want to highlight to Google what our most important pages are. We don't want them to be diluted within this massive library. So when we take on a client, it's one of the first things that we do, anyways, is purge a lot of content. And it is a bit different. It's it's a step that a lot of people don't tank, but I think it's a very necessary step. In, in terms of client as well, you somehow zeroed in on a, a niche within a niche. Uh, I would like to call it niche niche-ception, but yeah, why exactly? And is it also a beneficial thing to find a niche and then find a niche within that niche to actually be an expert, let's say, in that field? I have a, an opposing view here. Most coaches and mentors will be like, you need a niche, you need a niche. Niche or niche. I have no niche. idea. <laughs> and they'll tell you out of the gate to niche. But I think I'm more in the book. There's this book uh, called Range. It, it talks about Rafael Nadal, where his parents put him in all sports. And he had a natural propensity towards tennis. So he went all in with tennis. But imagine that his parents just stuck him in basketball. Mm-hmm. How good would he be? Right? Mm-hmm. So when it comes to finding a niche, I say, hey, start a bit broader, have all these experiences and find your niche through those experiences. What do you what industry do you love working with? Like who who can you serve and help the most? So that's kind of what I did with the affiliate marketing. I had hundreds (laughs) of different niches. And then I went and I, I started working with legal. I really liked legal. So then I I went and started working with legal. I didn't know at the time that there were these sub niches in legal. (laughs) I had no idea. Now, it makes sense in retrospect, when you drive through any major city in the United States, you see all the personal injury billboards. Yeah. What happened was about 70% of my revenue was generated from personal injury law firms. So it was a very easy transition for me. You know, 70% from less than 40% of my clientele, small clientele base. So I just naturally started positioning myself to that industry. I actually would sign a larger PI client and then I would refer out the others. So I didn't immediately dump everything. Right. But what happened was instead of having to get on the hamster wheel of hiring, Hmm. I actually improved my overall top line numbers, my profit margins, while not expanding my clientele base exponentially. Yeah. And I think if people hear most of this, they're very likely to be like, well, I think I should find my more specific niche or niche. (laughs) But um, I think the question that they might be asking themselves is, is there any downsides to this? Am I basically closing the doors to everything else by opening just this one door in front of me? There's definitely pros and cons. Anyone that tells you that there's just pros is full of it, right? So there are... 
industry I think the downturns and recessions. Are there cons that can be overturned or these are just cons that you just have to deal with? Personally, I think all the cons can be overturned. That's the attitude. <laughs> I, I will say that. And I've heard Alex Hermosi and a few others talk about this where they say, hey, once you've found your niche, you can ride that to say 10 million. I don't know why it's 10 million at eight figure mark, but when you start to approach it, you need to expand your your total addressable market, your 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 TAM. And what happens though is you have the revenue, you have the profit and capabilities to to go into these other industries. One of the worst things in business is undercapitalizing a business unit. And you see this frequently. Someone will launch a new service and they'll hire one employee to do the whole service. They don't have a strategy to obtain new business there. What if that person leaves? It's just undercapitalized. When most of the time you want two to three individuals for a new business unit, and it could be even a whole separate website. So for us, niching doesn't mean you have to say no. Right. It gives you optionality. Yeah, because I think on your um, rankings, I would say is more of just um, legal SEO, but also specialized in personal injury itself. So you're not really closing yeah, any doors here. Yeah, and there's a reason for that. There could be a personal injury attorney that types attorney SEO in. Right. They could sit and designate themselves as a PI attorney. And a lot of there's a lot more search volume for phrases like that from an SEO perspective. Also, when you when you choose to go upstream, you're for these larger firms, your marketing strategy changes. Downstream would be more the total addressable market approach, the spam your tan, if I'm yeah. <laughs> modeling Joey Gilkey. It is, you know, the the large amount of emails, the cold calling, the lower price points, the low touch. When you go upstream and you're dealing with nine figure businesses, it's high touch. Yeah. You're having dinner with them. You're sending them highly personalized messages, highly personalized gifts. It's not, they're just a number in this field of people. They, they are very special because they can have a very large impact on your business. Yeah. Um, to, I think, a little bit divert, you mentioned the 10 million mark, and that's something we also talked about before. Um, you crossed the 10 million mark too. And apart from that, keeping in touch with the field that you're in, the a number of awards your company has like won as well, um, you're a top 30 CEO. There are a lot of things that go on in a CEO's life, but how do you manage to have the personal life of it? Or how do you manage to at least work around not burning yourself out? I love what I do, first of all, for the burnout. I think of it as like a video game that plays that pays me. I really do. Okay. And I delegate the things that I don't want to do. Now, in the past, I had to wear a lot of hats and do a lot of things. I remember every time I was wearing the CEO hat and the finance accounts receivable hat, I would just curse to myself and I hated doing payroll and invoices. I hated it. But eventually I got to the point where I could hire someone to take over and do that well. And they love that. How do I manage the personal life? Um, it's it's the same thing. It's it's putting attention towards it. And like we like we talked before this podcast. I have these routines because the the latter half of my day, I can't do these things. I'm with my wife and busy. she doesn't want to listen to business podcasts and <laughs> and business audio books. I, I wish she did, right? <laughs> that um she has her own interests and and those interests, a lot of those are mine, and that's okay. And it works for us. I know some other individuals. Uh, we mentioned Alex and and Layla. You know, I talked about them earlier. You know, they're in the business, so like they're probably listening to business podcasts and they're hanging out, and that's what they're talking about. But it just it works for me and my wife, and it's kind of nice to decompress and do some other things and uh, as well. I think uh, not to downplay what you've said, but it is very um, easy to say that we need to have a balance between work life and personal life. But in this culture that we have now, I think with um, teenagers and kids growing up to be like, I have to work 20 hours a day. If I have to get to that point where I have to, you know, enjoy my CEO life or just enjoy my life, I have to put in that many hours. But what could actually, let's say, teach these kids and people aspiring to be great people and CEOs of companies? What can we at least let them know that, hey, this is a better and easier way to get what you want without having to compromise on your life? 
it's a really interesting topic that I've thought a lot about lately. And I would say that everyone needs to have a greater understanding of what leverage is. Leverage is more input. Your inputs have more outputs. Now, for example, pulling it back to that, that individual that's working, you know, 20 hours or eight hours. Yeah. In the beginning, you don't have leverage. All you have is your time. Yeah. You don't have capital leverage. You don't have media distribution leverage. You don't have employees. So it's just you. So at the beginning, you can work your eight hours, but if you have the health, the physical, the stanima, I would tell you, I would encourage you to put in those extra hours to really stand out, to acquire capital, which can acquire additional forms of leverage. Right. Meaning you can invest into an employee who can then do more work, exactly. or you can start a podcast, which can reach thousands of individuals Or you. There's, there's all different types of leverage and it's just to be aware of it in your business. And I think it's the most underrated topic of all time is leverage. Right. And that's I mean, what we're all looking for because leverage is associated with time. Yeah. I was going to say thank you for bringing up the podcast part because you're, you're moving me on to the next question. Yeah. <laughs> how, did, how did you start off the podcast thing? Was it also something where you found yourself um, asking? I was in. Okay. Yeah, I was in Jason Swink's mastermind. And this was around, I was thinking I was at like the two or three million mark. I'm not really sure. And he kept telling me over, it was like, recurring probably once a month he'd tell me chris you need to start a podcast and i was stubborn and just thought it was overwhelming to start and i remember i was like you know what i'm gonna do it and i just went and signed up for an agency i knew if i was on my own i needed that extra push if i put the money down i was gonna do it i started doing it. i was like hey this isn't so difficult i can do this and all day the rest is history i'm a much better talker and interviewer than I am a keyboard warrior, like sitting behind <laughs> writing blog articles. Right, so I'd right. much rather do this. Yeah. And uh, did you, I don't really know when you exactly started the podcast. I, I'm very sure that you've done quite a few. That too with some I good think, names like Grant Fishkin and Chris Doe, uh, Brian Dean, quite a few mm -hmm. uh, big names. So when did you start this? I think it was around 2019, 2019 or 2020. I mean, it's been a couple of years. I've been doing a, a weekly show for a couple of years now and consistently there was a, yeah consistently i've never missed a, a, the weekly episode there right. was a period of time where i was like i got i i developed a large queue and i'm like i'm gonna go to two a week <laughs> and i learned really quickly that that was really hard to maintain yeah and do everything else i was doing so i went back to a weekly show so that's why if you count the weeks it's it may be a little bit more but uh, I, I got a little aggressive there for short term and, and then went back to weekly. Yeah, we, we kind of went the aggressive route too. Uh, we kind of tried putting out a podcast every day and we also quickly realized we cannot do that. <laughs> so we started going like a little yeah. bit more chill, take it a little bit more relaxed and do it when we're actually free and available to make time for this. Absolutely. That, that, that quality, that qualitative perspective really stands out. I, I look at like Neil Patel and, um, I can't think the single grain, uh, his co-host, I can't think of his name just at the moment, but anyways, they do the, the, the daily show and what they do is they'll, they'll just probably batch a lot of episodes at once record maybe once a month and then get all their episodes. I'm not sure how they're doing it, but, but they're batching for sure. Uh, probably. I think a lot of podcasts that I've also watched, I think they just try to have one whole day full of podcasts so that the next what month or so they can just keep releasing them. Yeah, but Eric Sue, Eric Sue was who I was thinking of. Yeah. Right, right. So I think it comes back to the first question we had about you starting a day early. So how does it, how does it work? Where does podcast time come in for this? If it's once a week, at least. Is it for us, we have a podcast production company. We use lower street. They do phenomenal sound work. Uh, they, have excellent producers that help with guest research. Okay. I have a marketing employee that helps with the guest selection. He'll send me a hit list. I approve it. He'll go out and invite these individuals with a pitch deck to come on the show. We use Calendly for the invites, which has everything automated. And then basically the producer will send me the guest prep. I'll prep myself. I'll watch all of their YouTube videos. I may read their book, have a great conversation. 
goes back to the podcast production company. They're, they fix it all up, the audio, the sound. <laughs> and then and then it goes back to my team for distribution. So email newsletter, social, paid ads, uh, uh, you know, transcriptions, things like that. Yeah, so it's, I'd say we have around four people helping um, if you're right. counting the production team. Right. <clears throat> I think we have uh, maybe three people. We shall um, consider more options for our podcasting <laughs> options. Um, I feel like um, in terms of podcast, just to really stay here for a little bit longer, <clears throat> um, while it is a great way to showcase who a person is, what they do, and just have a general discussion about um, the ongoing topics and just current trends, um, is there kind of any personal relief that you get just to talk on a podcast show? Is there any kind of... Um, Feeling, feeling, just to have a chat, clear and honest. Sometimes, and it's it's really unexpected. And there's been a couple instances where I just was not expecting a conversation to go where it went, and I'll get like teary eyed, and it'll hit right. me emotionally. And that doesn't happen a lot, but there's been a few times that that's happened. There's been other s- situations where. I just really meshed well with the guest and we would shoot the bull and became kind of friends afterwards. And we talk on Instagram and (laughs) text each other. There are other instances where I, if I'm being completely transparent, I'm really dreading it. I'm either nervous or I don't understand the topic as well as I would like. And repeating a very well picture of myself right now. It's natural. I, I get anxiety, right? If I'm, I remember, so I sent a very custom request to Seth Godin. You know, he's been, what, a New York Times bestseller like 12 times. Yeah. And I got him on the show and he was like really early on. I don't know what episode he was. And I had read like several of his books, but I was very intimidated. And I remember a lot of anxiety, but I just overly prepped. And when we had the conversation, it was great because I was I was overly prepared. Yeah, But leading up to it, it was a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress. But leading up to post podcast after that, you got more, I guess, comfortable with just how to carry forward yourself and how to just have an organized podcast, right? I mean, Absolutely. Hopefully I get to that level soon. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it just takes time, right? And I would say that if you go listen to our first episodes, they weren't very good. The audio wasn't as good. The questions weren't as weren't as good, and just over time, that the more you do it, it's just like anything. The better you get, and the thing that I try to avoid is getting in these conversation loops, where the yeah. same conversation. If this individual's been on another show, I don't want to ask him the same questions. Yeah, I want to try to pull out different information. I had a little bit difficulty doing that because I was looking through all the different podcasts that you did with other people along with the podcast that you had on your show. And I was just like, he's covered everything. (laughs) What do I talk about really? (laughs) It's interesting though. Most of the time. So this is, this is objective. You've been reading business books, at least 50. I've read 62 this year already, you know, and, and through September, I've read at least 50 business books a year for the last 10 years. So we could talk about any form of business. And a lot of times that's missed. A lot of times people like speaking to me, they just talk about what are the SEO tactics, niching, because that's what yeah. I'm known for. Yeah. But like to get an, an eight figure business and, and, you know, we're shooting for nine figures next. I mean, it takes a lot of different business principles. So there's a lot we can talk about. And I hope maybe the next podcast itself, if you don't mind, we can get more into the deeper end of these things. Yeah, of course. I think um, I kind of had this intention where I wanted to be more, um, how do I say this, more educative on what we're doing. Just want people to know exactly what is going on. How do they, can like how can they benefit from what we have to offer? I'm kind of reconsidering everything now after what you said, because I'm like, wait a minute. No, I'm not trying to frustrate you. <laughs> you I'll try to give you different me. answers. <laughs> all right, all right. All right. <laughs> Uh, to put it again very uh, plainly and bluntly, if I was just a regular client and I came and approached you for help, what would be like the initial steps you could take to welcome me on board as a client? 
I'll give you the exact sales process. We receive a lead. We schedule that appointment. We call it a first-time appointment. On our first-time appointment, it's a free call. It's a qualifying call. Are they the right fit? I ask them how many cases they're getting. I ask them how they're marketing themselves. I ask them you know, what goals they have, all those kind of discovery type questions. If it makes sense to move on, we do a, a complete comprehensive discovery. Now, many individuals will sell, sell this. They'll call it a foot in the door. They'll call it a tripwire. They'll call it many other things. But we've already got their attention. We already have time as a sunk cost. On our favor. So if we schedule the next appointment, we do a very comprehensive analysis based upon their goals. Here's where you're at. Here's where you want to go. We we set these benchmarks. We have we check and identify their gaps, how many links they need, what they need to do with their website, how much content they need, what needs fixed on their website. It is very, very, very comprehensive. And we do not deliver that via email. We we present that in person. Okay, so it feels a bit more personal that way, and you can actually clear all doubts. I think upfront, but At, absolutely. I, I was going to ask, how is that really different from, let's say, a regular other provider? Our expertise, and it's really not. It's, it's really rough. not. It's mm -hmm. it's it's our approach to SEO. Yeah, and. So we have, that's, that's one of the challenges in the SEO space. It is one of the reasons why we niche because we're the only that I'm aware of SEO uh, for PI agent or for PI firms uh, agency out there that I'm aware of. There's many SEO agencies. There's many law firm SEO agencies. If you don't have a differentiator, well, how do you differentiate? Most of the time people will differentiate based upon cost. Yeah, And the problem with the race to the bottom is you just might win, right? You're lowering your profit margins. You're becoming a commodity. So you do have to look for things that are different to uh, different forms of value. That's the biggest issue that most businesses take is they immediately think that they need to lower their costs. But in actuality, most prospects aren't looking for that. They're looking for more value. They can't right. justify the expense based upon the value you're presenting. So you need to introduce more value and potentially increase your fees. But like you said, is we have our own approach to these analysis. We, we hired data scientists. We've had data scientists on staff for the last two years uh, that we worked with. We've uh, had them review 112,000 search results looking at the legal industry. Right now we're building software. I don't know if you've seen Brian Dean's study of his top yeah. ranking factors, and we've done one. Well, those were at one moment in time. Right now, they're completely useless, right? They're old, they're outdated. There's yeah. been algorithm updates. So our dashboard is looking at all of those on a real-time basis using AREF's API. Right. And it's going to be, so when there's an algorithm update, we can go see how it was impacted. As and when and it's happening in times. Absolutely. Not just looking at volatility and, you know, SimRush says, hey, there's, there's a lot of activity here. Well, Okay, well, what's happening? What now? <laughs> right, right. So I think it's like you've been, I think, very stressing on it. It's very comprehensive. And I think it's very transparent that to, you know, really saying we'll do this, but then not do this. But as, let's say, another SEO provider myself, how do I build that uniqueness where I can actually provide that kind of um, services without, you know, falling into that same line of everyone else? That's a challenge. That's a real challenge. And there was a Jonathan Dane, he owns Client Boost. And I heard him say this one time. He said, think of your business as a lemonade stand where all lemonade stands are on the same street. How would you be different? Because that's where we're at today. We all have a mobile device nearby or some form of it. Yeah. So if all lemonade stands are on the same street and your business is a lemonade stand, how are you going to be different? Is your lemonade frozen and theirs isn't? Do you have organic lemons? Do you deliver the lemonade to the car when the other individuals have to get out of the car? Do you have, uh, is your lemonade green? Do you decorate your lemonade stand instead of the classic? You've got Christmas lights. My feel, tons and um, tons of 
a lot of people ways are to automatically go for I'll just lower the cost and I'll make it look pretty. And is that enough? Yeah. Clearly not, I think. <laughs> let's let's look at this from a different perspective. In in the US, nearby, hundreds of fast food chains. Fast yeah. food, McDonald's, Burger King, hundreds. Yeah. How many high end steak joints are there? Hmm. One or two? Right, right. Who has more competition? Fair enough. Fair enough. Right. And also, the fast food restaurant has to get their margins based upon bundling, which is a form of discount, and they sell quantities, right? They get their profit margin through the soda or the fries. Yeah. This high end steak joint is an experience. They have much better ingredients, it's a whole experience. They have better profit margins. They have to sell as many units. But most people want to compete with the thousand restaurants when there's only two high end steak joints. Because because so, I want more fast food. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's absolutely r- ludicrous because most people have a limiting belief in what they can charge and the amount of value that they can provide. Right. It comes from expertise, and but I would ask if our form of investment to a nine figure business is not a number that ninety nine percent of SEO agencies will throw out there, but we will. Because we know what we're worth. Right. That's the difference. I think people have to find that worth. It's just they try to take the easy way out. Like you say, just go with the restaurant chain and just, you know, do what everyone else is doing, hoping to make a quick buck. It's that dedication, consistency, and I think overall quality over quantity that actually will probably get people to that. But I, again, I, I'm not really sure how people can convince themselves of actually pushing themselves to that level. I feel like a lot of people do enjoy the easy way out to actually get what they want. Yeah, let me let me push back on two things. Okay. I'm not an or person, quantity or quality. Right, I'm right. an and person. It's quality and quantity. Right. The other thing I would say is competency builds confidence. The more competent you are, the higher your ceiling becomes. You okay. can see opportunities. And in the better you to, are. In order to get to that level of competency, um, what would uh, Chris advise to do? If you think of Bloom's taxonomy, it's just pyramid, right? At the very bottom is recall. Everyone can go out and study and take an SEO quiz and maybe pass it. The next level up is, I believe, I'm going to miss a couple levels here. So the audience no listening, it knows blooms entirely. But let's just say the next level up is, is implement. You can read, but now you can actually do. The next step up is analyze. You can see what's wrong. All right. So I'm making the, the next change. step up. Now let's say the fourth tier. Now there's a couple tiers in here I'm missing. <laughs> I'm just trying to articulate a point here. Yeah, yeah. Is you can create. Because you have recall, because you know how to implement, because you know how to analyze, you can now create. This is applicable to all forms of business. The people that are at the top of Bloom's taxonomy are the unicorns that you're looking for. They're very expensive because they they are at the top of of this educational hierarchy. Everyone starts at recall at the bottom. And ask them to move up the ladder, move up the pyramid. Yeah, I think we have a little bit more time to talk. Um, I don't want to keep yeah. you from the. Uh, no, of course, hit now. hit me any any curveball, any random thing you're thinking. What would be your top three books itself to at least get people interested in what you do, or not what you do, and get interested in that field of stuff? The book that I study the most is Ready, Fire, Aim by Michael Masterson. It's okay. great for any level, any level of business. It's I constantly go back to it because it's just so powerful. It's one of the best business books out there. Another book, uh, I remember when I was an early entrepreneur, I had issues with delegation and and my role as a CEO. And I remember I reading The E-Myth Revisited by Michael okay. Gerber. And it was very powerful. The different levels of technician, manager, owner. So 
E-Myth, Ready, Fire, Aim. The next one's challenging. Um, There's so many out there. I would say one that comes to mind, geez, Ultimate Sales Machine, Chet Holmes. It's an older book, but it has a lot of great business principles, a lot of marketing initiatives in it. Offhand, just random books that are popping in my head that I just feel compelled to ask. It's $100 million offers by Alex Hermosi. I would say to check out um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Check out Rich's Man in Babylon. Uh, the Goal. They're... It's like the startup. Back 12 Pillars by... Read. Yeah. 12 Pillars by Jim Rohn. Those are all excellent books. Do and, you see yourself I can't coming remember. back to these books to give you some insight on something new coming up? Or did you just finish them and go like, I know it now. I'm good to go. That's one of the biggest issues with with individuals is they'll read a book and they'll never read it again. I read yeah. Rich's Man in Babylon probably 10 times, Ready, Fire, Aim probably five, Rich Dad Poor Dad a few times, uh, E-Myth a couple times. Um, they're, they're, it's just so... When you're going through different experiences with your business, things resonate more than others. If you're having a sales issue, you're focusing and you're, your attention is on that topic much more than if it's if it's not an issue. So mm. there are some of these books that they're from billionaires or, or very successful individuals, and, and they're putting down this immense amount of knowledge, but it's condensed into a book format. So you may there may be oversight when you're not feeling the pain in that area. And then when you revisit it, there's a lot of value in, in those chapters. Yeah, I, I do also feel like there might be that sector of people who go like, oh, you've written a book. Why exactly should I read it? Because this could be part of your marketing technique where you just keep on putting a book and establishing, establishing yourself. But I feel some books, like you've mentioned itself, are literally written to just inform and actually tell you how to do these things. So mm -hmm. keeping in line with that, besides the personal injury mastermind uh, podcast and of course SEO on air what would you say are the top three podcasts that you would listen to and advise listeners to what tune into I really enjoy my first million they have a range of topics they're they're just two entrepreneurs they've had uh, two, both of them have had successful exits very versed in business so I really enjoyed that when I was listening to it today actually I listened to Actually, let me pull up my phone and I'll just I'll just read some that are on. <laughs> Here right. we go. And you'll probably list all of this in the transcript itself, the books and the podcasts. I listen to some of Gary V's. I, I I don't prefer a curated podcast. I like a dedicated podcast. So sometimes Gary V's audio and, I, and but sometimes I listen to it. Really big I, in real estate investing. So I listen so yeah, to bigger um, pockets. To cut you off, and I don't like I'm sorry, but um I kind of heard the podcast you put up today itself and you mentioned Gary B. So I'm kind of mm -hmm. on the fence on that. Um you you do see that how some things work for Gary V works for Gary V. But there are some things he does talk about that are just a bit maybe not for everyone. Mm -hmm. Does that hinder how you really see Gary V and listening to his podcast? Or do you just go with the four, take it with a grain of salt? No, I mean, I personally love Gary V. You know, uh, Gary V and Grant Cardone are quantity, 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 right? Yeah. Quality subjective. And that works for them. But I would tell you, though, Gary V, when he's talking about how quality subjective, he has what? How large is his team? What, 30, yeah. 40 people? His his content quality is, is superb. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know if you just put out quantity for quantity's sake. I don't. I don't know that it's 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 the path. Um, I'm a, I am a big Grant Cardone fan. Grant Cardone <laughs> fan. He's a little bit polarizing. I've got Tim Ferriss on here. I've got Marketing School, Two Bobs, The Ed Milet Show. I've got Noah Kagan on here. Chris Walker, State of Demand Gen, Cardone Zone, uh, the Best Damn Agency Podcast. I've got some agency shows. Two Bobs. So I've got some that are really specific to what I do, some that are broader on business. I used to, when I was trying to learn sales, I had all kinds of sales podcasts on there, The Brutal Truth, Sales Gravy, things like that. But 
my interests kind of <laughs> ebb and flow based upon the challenges that I have with my business. Um, <clears throat> in the same manner of questions itself, um, since there are a lot of kids nowadays, of teenagers, millennials, they're all into social media and they're all mainly on social media. Um, I'm not too sure how many people there are who are um, prominent on social media doing the same thing that we are. But if you had to suggest social media pages, either a Twitter handle or Instagram page, or even LinkedIn for that matter, are there certain profiles that you think people should follow just for inspiration or motivation or just education? So I'm a millennial here. And first of all, I, I don't use Twitter. I, I've got a Twitter profile. It's a, it's a curated version. I do like LinkedIn because the conversations are business centric. Those are a lot of ent entrepreneurs there. I don't like how the feed just pulls in everything. In terms of all the social media networks, I, I'm a TikTok guy right now. <laughs> all right. I am whatever my interests are. I love it just because their algorithm is interest based. It's not who I'm following and what content they're putting out. Yeah. That's the thing on Instagram. I love Ed my letter, Gary V or whoever, but like sometimes the content they put out, just I'm not interested in. I love it's those things, right? They're phenomenal. It's right. not a, like, I don't, it's not an interest for me at this moment in time. Now they right, mix right. it up and they keep it engaging. The difference is when I go to TikTok and I type in a keyword or I start to engage on certain posts, I'm seeing those posts over and over, like similar types of posts. Right. So for, and it's in short form, you know, five to 30 seconds, it seems like most of the content are there I'm looking. TikTok people who are in this field? Because I'm not really too sure. I haven't, Absolutely. I don't have TikTok yet. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Nathan Gotch is on there in terms of SEO. I don't, to be honest, I don't, I don't follow a lot of the SEO guys. Um, right. It's more of a lot of marketing. It's, it's more business or marketing. Right. Okay. Yep. The thing is, there's like three main pillars when it comes to SEO. And, and a lot of SEO people try to overcomplicate what it is, right? And we can get really granular. I can get as yeah. granular <laughs> as you want around any random thing an SEO person's talked about. But great content, a great website, and earning backlinks. That's the name that's of the game. Pretty much it. That's it. Yeah. And we can talk about 301s and site architecture and all these, whatever, right? Yeah. It comes down to those three. Um, you brought up TikTok, um, and I was mainly thinking about the three major ones, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Um, but TikTok has really shown its like presence in the field of social media. And I think it's pretty taking them by storm. I'm not too sure when they um, put up the update about it, but they were moving towards TikTok being a search engine as well, or it's kind of acting as one right now. Mm -hmm. Do you feel it could gain some traction and grow into something? I think it could. I think the amount of content that it's obtained, I think it's algorithm showing interest-based and in the different forms of search criteria that you can use. I love it personally. It's hard to put it away. It's, it, it just depends. So they, right now they don't have enough content to do that. So content it's interesting. Doesn't... Yeah, the, uh, what I'll say here is the, the monetization play for social media is get users to come to congregate, get a bunch of free content, extend the organic reach, and then dilute the organic reach and make it pay to play. Look at Facebook, look at Instagram. <laughs> you don't even show up in the feed. It's pay to play. Yeah. And the same is going to happen for TikTok. That's why right now is the prime time. And it, that's also why Instagram Reels and YouTube Shorts aren't pay to play. They're competing with, with that community. They're, they're trying to compete with TikTok and pull users back. So it's just being aware of that and knowing where to put your effort it's attention arbitrage. It is, it is shifting where you need to apply the, 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 the most amount of effort because you, you get more output. Do you feel leverage. like TikTok would rival a proper search engine like Google itself? Or will it just be there as something you can do, an extra feature? It's hard to say. 
you know, I'm a Google guy, right? I own an SEO <laughs> agency. So yeah, you yeah. got a little bit of fear, fear of for me, I guess. Um, Google isn't listening. I, 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 well, I find it hard. The amount of information on Google is going to be hard to challenge. I mean, we're talking trillions upon trillions. I, I, who knows how much information they have. It's going to be really difficult to have something like that. Now, could TikTok challenge YouTube? Maybe. And Instagram, I think, as well. Mm -hmm. I think maybe uh, from personal experience itself, I think YouTube has kind of established itself as a well-to-do uh, platform <clears throat> that doesn't see any rival anytime soon. I think Instagram um, is the one that's got its um, got to worry about a bit because TikTok is really mm -hmm. taking their um, their market share. Yeah, I mean, Facebook uh, or Meta, whatever they're called, I mean... It is having a bit another abysmal day the other day in the stock market. I mean, it's clear. I mean, individuals are moving away from that platform to other platforms. Um, I think I wanted to talk a little bit more about TikTok, but I want to also quickly just talk about just two things. Um, you were playing basketball once upon a time. Do you ever feel you would just, I mean, do you play for fun anymore or? Yeah, I had a court at my previous house. I don't right now. Um, I played intramural and alumni basketball for many years after college. The, the truth is, I am not physically capable to play at the, at the level that I used to be able to play at. Right. I was a captain of our conference, every all tournament team. You know, I, I could dunk a basketball till I was like 32. Um, that is no longer the case. And I put on a lot of weight. So, Shooting around, holding my own with anybody, but playing a pickup game and then, you know, full court basketball, there's just no not way. Happening. Not right now. <laughs> but um, like a lot of people, how did you get to that shift where you had the passion and drive for basketball to the point where you were training people as well? I think you were coach. How did you move from yeah. there to here? John Morgan talks about what you're born to be. And I, and he talks about born as a lion or a sloth, right? Two people are born every day, but a lion's the king of the jungle, right? If you're, uh, if you're a sloth born in the jungle, you're a sloth. You're, you're, you know, you, you're it. out of luck. <laughs> I've always, always been competitive. I don't know if there's an insecurity thing or a, I don't know what it is. And maybe my upbringing, my dad is, you know, he's very, you only play the game to win. That's it. Second place is the first loser. It is like, yeah. don't give me your second place trophy. It's literally the same. My comment, my dad used to tell me all the time. Second yeah. is first loser. And you just can't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. You, you don't get participation trophies. So yeah, I've just been competitive and I didn't know about this business world. So all of my energy was into basketball and I'm talking, I, I begged and begged our superintendent of the high school to give me a key. No one else had a key. I went in there in off hours. I convinced him to let me play, you know, before school and after school uh, weekends. I remember the first time my friends wanted to play basketball with my dad and go to one of our practices. I said, guys, I said, this isn't like pickup. I was like, this isn't going to be fun. Yeah. And they went once and then they never went again because it was practice. <laughs> so that's just how I was built. And from, uh, I think actually, you know, we'll be kind of cutting it short with this. Um, there is another question that I have, and I'm not too sure um, if we should include it in the podcast itself. And it is a kind of a very personal kind of question. So I, I, I would like to sure, know. Sure, of course. Um, a lot of people, without even having to own a business and run a business itself, go through a lot of mental health issues, whether it's depression, anxiety, just in general, a lot of other minor of things. But it is trying to get normalized. And I think, in, at least for me, in order to normalize it, we do have to be open and talk mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. Have there been moments where you needed to, let's say, visit a therapist or at least have some counseling done because there were a bit too much going on? I haven't went to a therapist. I probably should have at certain points in time. I mean, there's been very stressful situations. I remember just not decompressing, right? Every single day I read these business books and every, any, when I'm laying in bed, I'm like wanting to read business. And I remember I went 
I was having this really stressful week where it was just kind of overwhelming. And I was mentally fortitude, very strong. And I remember I went to Barnes and Noble on the weekend and I was trying to not, you know, trying to take a break. And I went by the business book section and I went to grab a book and it like triggered everything that I was going through. And I like had a little minor panic attack and got real shaky, got real sick. Um, I've had, fortunately, my president, Stephen Willie, I say he sings like whale songs. He is a very, he's an amazing confidant, amazing partner. So any stresses, he really brings it down a notch. So I've had him for nine of the 10 years. And I'm talking when we were startup, the first three to four years, we sat right next to each other and worked every single day. So he was in person right next to me. So he really helped me. My sister owns a plumbing company that's 30, 40 million dollars. I mean, big plumbing company. And she's two years younger than me, started business before me. She was someone that I could really talk to a lot. I've had coaches that I've spoken to that are essentially therapists. Yeah. And yeah, I've had a good support I would system. Classify so that I've had a good support system. And there, there's, there's been ups and downs for sure. I remember one of the biggest challenges I had was about five years in, I overhired and I wasn't monitoring finances consistently enough. And I wasn't grown up with the big boys, with the <laughs> director of finance and then and the gate data. Right. And, it, and I had to take on a whole bunch of debt. That was a hard learning lesson. That was a lot of stress and we don't carry any debt. That's the only time we've ever carried debt. But those situations occur, and fortunately now I'm in a space where through my investments through real estate and through other areas where you couldn't take me out and still have some stress, but I don't have the same level of stress where it could just totally take me to zero. Right. I feel a lot of people have that difficulty finding that space itself where they could get to a comfort zone where they could either talk about it or at least understand that this is going on with them. Like just awareness itself would be good. Chris, it was really amazing talking to you. Yeah, um, Aaron. You've made it very comfortable with me itself. Um, I did good. feel in the beginning itself, at least, I think you might've seen how a bit rigid I was. And then over time, I've just felt more comfortable. Thank you for that. Yeah, it was an excellent conversation. Really good questions. Thank you so much again. Um, it was really enlightening talk. Um, I hope we can do this another time and uh, I hope you have a great time. All right. Sounds All right. good. Here. All right. Take care. Cool. You too. Bye. Now. Bye.